I'd like to thank um, the SEL Industry Advisory Board members for their participation today. Most of them are up there at the top, as well as the grad students and faculty from across the institute. Um, uh, so today we're going to focus on supply chain applications and supply chain facility design with two of our long-term and wonderful faculty members, uh, Professor David Goldsman and uh, Professor Christos Alexopoulos. So without further delay, Dave. Thanks, Tim. Uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, uh, so I'll be um, talking about uh, simulation of uh, actually general systems with particular examples on supply chains. Uh, I'm going to start out really, really easy uh, and give an overview of simulation. In fact, I'm go through the outline here. Uh, I'll give a little intro with some history. And uh, depending on what we want to do, I can be very flexible about uh, discussing that. Uh, I'll, we'll give some very easy examples and then kind of exponentiate up into uh, some more interesting examples um, uh, involving uh, uh, more substantial simulations. Um, and feel free to ask questions along the way, uh, uh, no problem with that. So I'm going to give a really simple few slides on what simulation is, and some people haven't had that here. Um, and uh, we're, we're interested in using simulation to mimic uh, natural uh, systems that you, you'd see uh, uh, in the service sector and um, uh, in health systems. Uh, you can kind of simulate everything, uh, but in order to do that, you need to start with a model. And as everybody learns probably in their first course in industrial engineering, models are just these high level rep representations of real world systems. Um, and um, let's see if I can figure out how to use the thing here. Um, in, in the classes that Christos and I teach, uh, we're primarily concerned with uh, models that are discrete, so that they change, the, the system state will change every once in a while, like in a queuing system, customers show up, they leave, uh, but it's not happening every single millisecond. Um, and um, uh, although deterministic systems are very, very nice, um, they're uh, a little less exciting than systems that have uh, stochastic components. So we're interested in things that have a little probability here and there. And uh, we're also interested in dynamic systems that change over time. I would say that uh, supply chain systems are uh, completely dynamic. So um, in general, uh, you can solve models, by, uh, solve models by plugging into an equation. I can throw a rock off of a cliff. And if there's uh, no friction and I know my initial velocity, I can tell you where the rock is going to be in five seconds. Um, but usually things aren't so simple in the problems that we do and you might have to, um, instead of plugging into a nice simple equation, you might have to resort to a numerical solution. So if you're trying to predict the weather, you may have to uh, numerically solve hundreds or thousands of differential equations. And uh, I used to be able to do that in my head, but I can't do that anymore. And so you probably need numerical methods for that. And in some cases, when even those methods don't work, or in other cases where uh, simulation just happens to be appropriate, uh, simulation's a, a very good method uh, uh, to use instead. We'll talk about some of those. So uh, simulation's just the imitation of a real world system as it evolves over time. Um, and what we typically do is we run a simulation, generates an artificial history, of things that happen. Uh, you, you collect uh, data from the artificial history and then you make uh, inferences or conclusions uh, based on the amalgamation of data. It's, um, uh, I read this some years ago, but yeah, we finished in the top three. You were saying number three, we didn't, we didn't push past statistics and uh, engineering econ. Okay, well, with my apologies to my optimization friends, a couple of which I see here, uh, we're ahead of you guys, sorry, Martin. Uh, and so simulation is used by a lot of people. Uh, and uh, it's certainly a, a pervasive technology and, uh, uh, used by uh, people in school, people in practice, uh, and um, has very nice uh, theory and, uh, and applied uh, 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 uses. Um, certainly, it's an indispensable problem-solving methodology, and we'll look at a bunch of examples, some of which are supply chains, some not. Uh, you'll see that it has lots of uh, uses. Um, simulation can be used to describe uh, the behavior of uh, any uh, reasonable system. Uh, the system can exist or it can be on the drawing board. Um, 
Uh, in particular, you can ask uh, what if questions about the system. Uh, what if I add another server? Or what if uh, uh, this uh, warehouse uh, gets flooded and I can't use it? Uh, you can see what the impacts of uh, different decisions and, and uh, 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 different events are on, on the system. Um, you can use simulation to uh, help in designing system and, and optimizing. Well, optimizing is a little difficult. You can still uh, use it for that. Um, and the nice thing is that almost anything can be simulated um, and sometimes pretty well. So um, I've been interested for a while in simulating financial systems. Uh, those may not be inter interesting to people in supply chain. Uh, uh, so what I, what I would do is I would just simulate the, the, some uh, stock price propagation maybe a million times and see what an option is worth. So, uh, might be boring to some, but not to everyone. Uh, the more interesting thing uh, for people here might be uh, uh, things that involve uh, customers. You know, all these uh, different things like uh, call centers, manufacturing systems, supply chains, all that stuff. Um, and there's lots of reasons to simulate. You might want to know, uh, will your system accomplish a particular goal? Can you get all the orders out on time? Uh, are people going to have to wait in line a long time? Uh, can uh, uh, will the supply chain function properly? Uh, if the current system won't accomplish its goals, what do you do? Do you add stuff? Uh, uh, do you uh, 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 hire more servers, et cetera, et cetera? And then all this other stuff, I'll just say blah, blah, blah. Uh, simulation's very nice. Sometimes uh, people might be interested in uh, making pretty graphics so that, the, uh, so that the guys at UGA can understand. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't very nice. Uh, uh, we do? Oh, I apologize. We have any UGA people? <laughs> yes? Okay, well, if we, from now on, I'll just say like Kansas State or something. Okay. Uh, so you can look at models that are too complicated for numerical treatment. That's one of the reasons you would use simulation. You can study very detailed relationships so you can see where everything in the supply chain is at any given moment, uh, in the simulation at least. And you can't do that with with queuing theory equations. I mean, I can give you the, um, the expected number of, uh, of people in the system for an MM1 queuing process in steady state, row over one minus row, but that doesn't really tell you about what's actually going on at any given time. Um, and then again, blah, 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 lots of other things. It's a really nice demo method. Uh, and again, you know, uh, 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 it's not, simulation is, is nice for demoing, but of course it, in, in, uh, in application you would use it to work on problems, not, not just for demos. The nice thing is, um, in some cases, simulation is very, very easy to use. Um, there are cases where Christos and I have walked into a, a small hospital and just gone click, 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 and we've got a, a, a moderately okay simulation of that simple system. But on the other hand, um, Simulation is often not so easy, and uh, we'll, we'll show you a, a couple simulations later on uh, that, that took a little bit more work. Um, and uh, sometimes it's a little bit costly uh, uh, to implement, uh, it takes a lot of time, uh, you know, but if, if it saves time and does a correct analysis, I guess that's okay. Um, one thing that uh, we're always concerned with is that uh, people will run a, a gigantic simulation uh, maybe it takes quite a bit of time to do it, and then they, they get kind of quote unquote the answer. And people forget that a simulation is just a, uh, an experiment, and you, uh, the, the answer that you get from the simulation is just a, it's an estimate, it's an observation. And so people sometimes forget to uh, perform a, a proper statistical analysis on the outputs from the simulation. Uh, that's, that's for another day though. And, and sometimes um, uh, uh, you get a little spoiled, you get pretty good at the simulation, and you might use simulation when other methods might exist to do the problem. So I'm, I'm just going to go through some history really fast, because luckily, you know, we have until 3 o'clock today before I have to let everybody go, so it's no, no problem. Um, the, the first uh, example that, that I found where people use simulation goes back to the 1700s. This Buffon's needle problem, uh, just in 30 seconds, the, uh, Mr. Buffon uh, uh, wrote a whole, uh, drew a whole bunch of parallel lines equally spaced on the floor, uh, threw a pencil of a certain size uh, 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 on the floor randomly, and uh, uh, by counting up the number of times, uh, he was able to, uh, the, the pencil landed between the parallel lines, not across them. Um, he was able to reverse uh, engineer an estimate for pi. So 
So, wow, he's famous for that, I guess. Um, then maybe a, a more practical application of simulation um, is uh, in the early 1900s, um, uh, this guy, William Gossett, in the picture, um, was employed by uh, uh, Guinness, uh, a beer company in Ireland, uh, and he was sort of in charge of quality control. They didn't call it that then, but uh, he was the statistician at the company, and they actually had a competitive advantage because he was the only statistician at an Irish beer company. And um, along the way, he um, uh, was thinking about and essentially discovered the T distribution. Um, uh, and so uh, that's great. He wanted to publish it, but the beer company didn't want him to because that would give away their competitive advantage. And so uh, he published under the name uh, Student. That's where that comes from. And um, what was interesting is that he, he wasn't able to uh, use uh, beer examples because, again, that would give away the competitive advantage. So uh, what he did, he um, <laughs> took a bunch of observations. Uh, uh, I think they were the pinky fingers. No, middle. Middle fingers <laughs> all right, of, um, of uh, British prisoners. Uh, and he, he um, uh, took their lengths. Uh, put them in a hat and started taking out random samples of these uh, lengths. He wasn't taking random samples of the fingers, uh, just little pieces of paper. Uh, and um, from those random samples, he was uh, able to get histograms that look like what we now know uh, is a T distribution. And these samples, he was basically doing a simulation, uh, finger simulation, I guess. Uh, then in the <coughs> 1940s, uh, people um, started using uh, uh, mainframe computers. Uh, to simulate um, uh, atomic and nuclear weapons uh, characteristics. Uh, and finally, um, um, uh, things that we're interested in, um, industrial applications came to the fore in the 1960s, and people started simulating manufacturing systems, queuing systems. Um, this guy, Harry Markowitz, um, uh, if, if you're old like me, you, you might have used this language called SimScript. Uh, once in your lives, and uh, he's a very famous guy because he um, uh, he was the uh, main developer of SimScript, which is probably the first major language that a lot of people use to, to do simulations. Um, some people here may know him for something else. The Nobel Prize. What would that be? Nobel Prize. Yeah, he's the father of portfolio theory, uh, and he won a Nobel Prize for that uh, some years ago. But he also did simulation. Uh, then, uh, over the last 30 years or so, uh, there's been much more uh, rigorous work. Um, and so simulation and manufacturing is probably what people use most often. Um, you can calculate movement of parts. And um, you, know, you can associate a, a manufacturing system maybe as a giant queuing network. And so uh, that, that would, in some uh, vague sense, would resemble a supply chain, in a very vague sense. Um, you can see how parts or customers flow through the system. Uh, and again, additional stuff, uh, how you can, uh, uh, you can use simulation to maybe eliminate bottlenecks and design blunders before they happen. Uh, so typical questions might be, what's the throughput? Um, how, how much can you get through your system, whether it's a manufacturing system, a service system, a supply system? Um, how can we change the throughput? Um, what happens to the bottlenecks? If you, if you get rid of a bottleneck here, it may propagate downstream. And uh, you can figure that out before it happens. And again, blah, 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 additional uh, questions you can answer. OK, so this is what I used to think simulation was for the first uh, 40 or 50 years that I was here at Georgia Tech. And then, 50? Yeah, I've been here a while now. Um, so um, uh, in fact, this is very nice to do all this theory, but um, there's tons of actual applications. And uh, here, here are some that just Christos and I have done. Uh, you know, let alone uh, what other the applied folks in the department have done. You know, many, many more than this. Um, simulated uh, car manufacturing plants, uh, uh, one of the Millican facilities downstate. Uh, lots of queuing problems. Um, yeah, for some reason, I like doing fast food uh, drive-throughs, uh, but uh, they're they're kind of fun to do. Uh, uh, we, uh, a bunch of us at Georgia Tech actually simulated the first um, security line through Hartsfield-Jackson after 9-11. I guess they liked our work so much they went out and hired a consulting company afterwards. Um, but, but in fact, um, uh, you know, simulation was a, a good tool to determine how many lines that they need, uh, would need and what were the consequences of not having enough people. 
uh, let's see, here's my son Dennis and daughter Mina 10 years ago. Uh, when uh, I, I taught uh, Dennis how to do arena in one day, which is a simulation language, and uh, he, uh, 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 he actually did a very nice little simulation of a, I don't know how he came up with this, but a combination uh, slaughterhouse, fast food restaurant, and amusement park. And uh, I'll, I'll show you, let's see if I can make this work here. <laughs> it's pretty ingenious so for an eight-year-old kid. And Dennis isn't very smart, too, so it just, uh, <laughs> Pretty amazing. No, I, I, that's a joke. I mean, he actually started Georgia Tech uh, two days ago. We're very, very proud of him. Uh, so let's see. So let's see if I can make this work. See, he made. He drew the little cows. Oh, oh let's see. It's not. Uh, how do I make this? Um, you know, I might have to. Uh, little, yeah. How do I get over there? <laughs> it's a great simulation if you can only see it. Okay, no. uh, it's arena here. Can you guys? Okay, yeah. So I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll just have to manipulate things up. Yeah. So uh, you can see, uh, if I slow this down a little bit, he's drawn little cows, and um, they're, they're over here at the slaughterhouse. They get processed and eventually turn into little slabs of meat. Uh, they meet up with the uh, customers at the White Castle. Off they go to be consumed, and then down here, he did this in one day, believe it or not. Uh, uh, over here is where, uh, the, this is the amusement park, and you can picture these little trapezoid things. Uh, these are accumulators of customers, and when you, get a, when you get a certain number of customers in the accumulator, they get batched off. You know, when you're at Disney World, you, you wait until uh, the, the, the ride gets enough customers in it, and then off it goes. So you figure out how to do this pretty quickly. Um, let's see, I can, I'll run it until we get, see, did you see that one in the bottom? They all left, kind of cool. Okay, let's stop that. All right, so let's see. I'm going to just have to go back and forth uh, uh, to these. And I'll do the best I can. Okay. Um, so that's just you know, a very typical thing that you can write up very quickly. Um, the, um, uh, in terms of supply chains, I mean, this, uh, this is sort of the easiest uh, uh, version of the supply chain. Uh, I've drawn some connections. And you know, a real supply chain, like at Home Depot, uh, might have uh, hundreds of thousands of customers and you know, many, many other suppliers. Um, so what it is, uh, you can think of a supply chain in raw terms as a bunch of uh, 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 nodes in a network c connected in various ways. Uh, I, I haven't drawn any feedback loops here, but I guess the, the arrows can be completely arbitrary, and I haven't drawn flow of information, which is very important in supply chains, but uh, you know, the arrows can go any place. And um, what, what's interesting um, is that this really ki kind of does look like a flow chart, and in a lot of these simulation languages, um, uh, uh, coding up flow charts is pretty easy. Uh, now, th that's not to say that it's easy to do all the connections, but uh, it's not, not too bad. Uh, I remember when I first got here, uh, one of my buddies, uh, who's a professor here, uh, said, uh, well, why would you ever use a simulation in a supply chain? Well, I mean, I think we can think of things, uh, uh, um, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, but uh, now uh, a lot of the uh, 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 consulting companies are developing their own uh, supply chain products that use simulation. And there, there's a couple of companies completely devoted to that. Um, and, and it kind of makes sense because everything uh, in a supply chain has uh, some randomness. Uh, any forecast is going to have randomness. Uh, uh, lead times, travel times, everything is, is random. And so um, uh, simulation can be used uh, to assess uh, the effects of randomness, is a particular solution strategy, is that robust against violations in your assumptions? Uh, I mean, everybody knows that uh, uh, you know, a number of years ago, JetBlue had a meltdown during a minor blizzard in uh, was Denver, and it took them two, two weeks to recover, whereas the other airlines uh, were you know, back on board lickety-split because uh, JetBlue had over-optimized its system and didn't have a robust uh, optimization that it used. So here's some other applications, lots and lots. Um, at Georgia Tech, we do a lot of health systems, um, some, some of which involve supply chain, patient flow, hospital room allocation, procurement of supplies. Um, 
uh, there's a major supply chain problem involving procurement of, um, of vaccination for swine flu because the supply chain broke down and actually half the vaccination was no good. Uh, luckily, swine flu wasn't, it wasn't a particularly bad outbreak and it was, uh, in the big scheme of things, it was actually less harmful than uh, seasonal influenza, believe it or not. Uh, we got lucky though. Um, the, we use simulation sometimes for disease surveillance, uh, propagation of disease modeling, things like that. I'll just give you, uh, I put this in red because I'll just give you a kind of a, I don't know if it's a funny example, but it's a, an example. And, and of course we do a lot of humanitarian logistics uh, in the department and a lot of people use simulation uh, in those applications. Um, so with surveillance, that, that's uh, something I've been interested in lately. It doesn't really have any supply chain applications, but I thought I'd put it in. Um, you can use simulation to monitor time series, um, things like unemployment rates or um, um, the, uh, the quality of, of a product. You can use simulation to determine if something is going out of control or if some interesting thing is happening. Um, you can predict issues before they happen, if you're a little lucky. Um, you know, for instance, is a disease uh, in the process of becoming a, an outbreak? Uh, and uh, when is something out of the ordinary occurring? Um, What's nice is that you can read in tons and tons of data set, uh, big data sets and make conclusions based on that and, uh, used in conjunction with simulation. So why am I interested in that? Well, um, I don't know if anybody recognizes this fella. No? He's a serial killer. Um, and uh, there are some of his victims. He was a doctor uh, at a hospital in, in um, England. And you can look through the details here. You know, he's no longer with us. Um, but um, uh, he was caught because uh, his, um, his uh, uh, pattern of uh, giving, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at this, the, 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 his pattern of injecting or giving uh, these poor women uh, extra morphine um, uh, resulted in a um, mortality uh, curve that looked like this, that had this big bump uh, uh, between uh, 12 and 6. And um, it, it was eventually caught uh, by nobody using uh, simulation or statistics, but eventually caught. In retrospect, People have used this example uh, as um, an example where you'd like to uh, devise methods to detect these things uh, very quickly uh, before such a big bump arises. And to make a long story short, uh, you would use simulation here uh, because the hypothesis test, in this case murder versus no murder, is a complicated one that doesn't involve uh, the normal distribution or the chi-square distribution, it involves a crazy distribution. Uh, you simulate the distribution and then you find out uh, when the sample statistic of, of, uh, uh, of the thing that you're using to estimate the death rate, you, you, uh, you use simulation to determine wh when you're past that 95th uh, percentile where you would reject the null hypothesis of no murder. So it, it's just very interesting. Okay, that was a little diversion. Um, I'm gonna give a couple really easy examples and then um, we'll uh, do a, a little uh, more interesting examples and um, uh, uh, culminating in uh, uh, fairly significant simulations. So. I just made up stupid names for these. If you've had my simulation class before, uh, you might have seen a couple of them. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do a, a very classic problem and then uh, uh, evolve over to bigger ones. So um, in this example, um, we have a lot of people in this room um, and I can guarantee that some of us have the same birthdays. Uh, in fact, um, uh, just to cut to the chase, um, if you have 23 people in the room, um, uh, you're, you've got about a 50-50 chance of having a match uh, somewhere in the room of, of, of between at least two of these people having the same birth. And that's assuming that everybody's got a one out of 365 chance of being born on any particular day and we don't have any twins who are freaks and uh, you know, no, no February 29th people who are even worse. Um, so, so it turns out it's a trivial <coughs> math problem to determine this. And uh, I think what I'll do is I'll just go, I, I've got, oh no, that's the wrong. I've got too many things sitting up here. Uh, let me, yeah, supposedly I have this, uh, I don't know if it's good. Oh, it came up on the screen, great. Uh, this is a really old VB application, so that's why all that stuff is blacked out. I have no idea why. Uh, but I'll just, I'll just run this uh, program very quickly. And what I'll do, is I'm, I'm just going to generate some random birthdays. Let's see if we get a match. I have no idea what the, the answer is going to be here, how many it takes. So click, click, click. 
It's generating these birthdays. So there's 23. We just got a little unlucky this time. Um, let's see how long it takes. I did, yeah, all right, 33. So it took 33 before I got a match. On average, and, and also the median, it, it takes 23 people to get a match. And this is just a trivial little simulation. Um, do you mind if I spend, I, I always like doing this. Could, could I spend about a minute doing that, uh, doing no, this in the no. class? Is that all right? Thanks. Yeah, I'll hurry up, I'll hurry up. Yeah, uh, this will be the only one I do, all right? So, yeah. yeah, Christos has things to say. Um, yeah, okay, uh, uh, just real fast. I was born April 22nd, uh, when we were, I, well, your birthday is recently, right? Uh, August 17th. August 17th? 25th of January. 25th of January? 21st of January. 21st, okay, by the way, you can stop us when we get a match. Christos? Another day. What? February 17th. February 17th? Michael Jordan. M Michael Jordan's birthday. <laughs> I, well, the, the basketball skills are there, Christos. Yeah, uh, when, when's your birthday? Oh, we'll go in order, when's yours? December 8th, July 23rd. July 23rd. Oh, we got a match. Double match? Yeah, and you're also? Oh, we, we have uh, three matches there. Yeah, amazing, absolutely amazing. So we had a triple match after just a few people. Um, yeah, the, in fact, the first time I ever did this, the reason I was whining about the twins is because they were sitting right in the first row and I didn't even notice. And, 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 <laughs> yeah, and, and a, a couple days ago I, I did this in my class and I had some big, huge guy and his, he was born on my mom's birthday and you know, so I said, Mommy? And, <laughs> a little weird, but uh, it, it's really fun. I mean, and, it, and it always, I, I like doing this and I apologize for wasting time, but we, we, it, it's like the fantasy scenario in class because I had I had a guy that had a birthday on March 4th, which is the only command of the year, and then on uh, uh, May the 4th, like the Star Wars day. So it was great. All my jokes worked. Okay, so let's see. You know what I'll do because of time considerations, and Christos is getting a little itchy. Um, what I'm going to do is um, I'll um, I'll skip ahead. Uh, uh, I, I have so many examples here. I'm just going to way ahead here and. Um, Skipping. If you want to see these uh, examples, I'll, I'll post the uh, thing. I'm going to look at a couple slightly more significant things now. We'll try to exponentiate a little bit. Um, I hope these uh, work. This is just um, if you were at a little, uh, oh, it works. If you were at a, um, a small service center, or, or uh, say you're at McDonald's versus Burger King, uh, does Burger King have a one line that winds through and yes. McDonald's has a separate lines, right? So what I've done is uh, up at, this is just a little baby arena model, up at the top here, um, I'm generating a customer and then I make a clone of the customer. This guy is gonna join um, a long Burger King type line that feeds into two parallel servers. One line, two servers. This guy uh, is gonna go into two separate McDonald's lines and feed into the parallel servers separately. And this guy's really stupid. He's gonna go 50-50 into the lines. As a, what, what would you do? You go into the shortest line, right? But I, I'm doing 50-50 so you can tell the difference. Let's run the thing. And I'll hurry up here. So, oh, I guess these, these are little blue marbles. They're not people. Um, so you can see there, uh, every, every time I generate one customer on top, I generate the exact same customer on the bottom with the same arrival time, same service times. Uh, the only difference is one line feeding into two parallel servers versus two separate lines. And um, this is boring unless I run it real fast. This is, these numbers that you see at the beginning here on the left, these are average number in Q so far, and these are cycle times right here. You can see there's not much difference, but I'm gonna run the thing much faster. Here we go, let me slow it down a little bit. Okay, now you can see that um, up top, the average cycle time is about 19 minutes. The average cycle time down here, when we're doing the dumb 50-50 split into the separate lines, I devise this on purpose, uh, that turns out to be twice as big in this case. It's not gonna end up being that bad when I run it longer, but it's that. And the queue sizes, well the total queue up here is two and a half, and down here, uh, both of the queues are bigger than that. So you can see, uh, using simulation, you can trivially determine uh, which is the better strategy. Okay, so let's see, let me uh, continue with the show. And uh, um, uh, I'm interested in this question of disease propagation. This is not a supply chain example, obviously, but um, I, we just made a nice little quick simulation. Can you see that? Yeah, uh, if you look, uh, it's a little hard to see. Can you see the little guys moving around the school yeah. there? 
if you squint, I can see it just fine on my screen, but um, uh, th uh, these are uh, kids moving around school during the day, and you can see they're slowly uh, filling up the classrooms over here. Uh, and what we did is that we kept track of how many interactions the kids had with each other. You know, how often did they come within five feet of each other or sneeze on each other? Um, and, and we looked at different strategies uh, for uh, um, allowing student movement during the day, and we counted up the number of interactions using these different strategies to figure out which one's the best. And uh, just made this little video. Yeah, I wish it was a little easier to see, but... Uh. Yeah, it's, it's kind of nice, and you run the simulation multiple times, and, and you can say, well, um, having them, uh, you know, uh, moving against the walls is probably a better idea than having them randomly uh, whack into each other. Okay, so I'll stop that. So I'm trying to go fast, Christos. Um, this is a little maritime, well, let's spell simulation right next time. Uh, this, of course, you might argue that I'm spelling simple incorrectly, too, but no, this means simulation in Python language. So... Um, this is just something we wrote up, and I did a little uh, video of this. So here, um, uh, we're simulating uh, movement of um, ships uh, over the ocean uh, into the various ports. Mostly, we're mostly interested <laughs> in China and Singapore. Uh, if you notice a couple ships uh, uh, you know, cutting through Africa, uh, there is no uh, giant river through there. Uh, we were just lazy and didn't draw the arc properly. Um, and, and these are, we read in actual uh, ship departure and travel times and uh, looked at uh, some of the more, uh, major uh, companies. Um, and so uh, you can keep running track of how long uh, each ship takes to get from A, a to B. And uh, uh, what we're interested in are effects like what if uh, Panama Canal shuts down? Or what if um, uh, uh, we have global warming, which I'm just not sure if it exists. But what happens if we have it? Uh, will we, uh, you know, can we take proper advantage of the uh, Northwest Passage, things like that? Um, and so you can compare uh, the, uh, the different travel times and, and the consequences of breakdowns in uh, some of the uh, routes. That's nice. And, and this, this is a very simple simulation. The, the hard part here was not the simulation, but collecting the, the data. Um, there's plenty of data out there, but it's, it's messy and it's not consistent, et cetera, et cetera. So let's kill that. I'll spell simulation right next time. Um, then this is a, a, a problem, a, 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 an example that Christos and I did four or five years ago? No, 2005 to 2009. Whoa, that, that went fast, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and this, this is an example of... Um, uh, the, we, were, we were tasked with making a simulation of the existing uh, facilities at the Savannah port um, and uh, sort of self-contained Java code. Uh, where did we steal this from? A, a, a group in the Netherlands? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah he, he knows much more about this. Let me run the video. You want to explain it? Is that... Yeah. Just go yeah. Ahead. Okay. Okay. Let's hope this works. So this is what the, the port looked like you know, a few years ago. Now they're making... Yeah, so I guess we're zooming in from the top. And yeah, it's zooming, zooming from the top, and we're looking at the container yard. And uh, in a while, there will be, I guess there will be a train. Uh, but you can see movements of loading and unloading towards, you know, the, the berths. Uh, and those are trucks coming in. Yeah, the trucks, yard. you know, trucks coming in and out and moving. Uh, you can sometimes you can see cranes moving and doing unloading and unloading. I mean, the program still works uh, with the exception of the Java graphics. So we need to update the reference to the library. It still works. It's Java works on anything. Yeah. And you can kind of zoom into any level. Um, uh, this is sort of the highest level view. You know, as you can see, the cranes in the back there. It's kind of neat. And the nice thing is it, it doesn't cost uh, you know, twenty or $30,000 like some of these packages do. It's self-contained. OK, well, there you go. It's quick. Um, so that, that was fun. I guess, I'll say more later. Yeah. OK, let's see. And um, let me kill that. And I guess it's time for Christos. So he's, uh, it's going to take a second. We'll plug in um, his machine. And then uh, we'll talk about a project that's uh, ongoing. It's been a lot of fun. So. So 
No, um, the, the idea was to design a model that can be used for looking at alternative strategies for loading, unloading, you know, operational strategies at the port. Uh, after we developed the model, uh, and the model was, you know, full blown, unfortunately, or fortunately, the state purchased another simulation software which cost thousands of dollars and yeah, probably, you know, lots of money. And they're using Flexim, I think. But, uh, I mean, this is still one of my best, you know, the best projects I ever did. Because at the time, it was not convenient to split and merge trains. And so when the train comes, the train, you know, splits on different paths. Uh, and it was impossible with many of these languages to actually do that. Now, any logic can do and many of the languages can do it. But at the time, we, we started with AutoMod, which is very flexible for manufacturing operations. It could not split a train and it can still fake split a train. Uh, it, it actually doesn't even, even today, it doesn't split a train. Uh, so we were able to split a train uh, using Java, but it's... Okay, so before I start, I want to have, I have three amendments to what Dave said. Number one, he told Martin that optimization is number three uh, as a reference, you know, as a most useful tool in IEOR. Uh, it turns out if you combine optimization and simulation, it's definitely number one. Because I don't know if anybody who does, you know, optimization today that doesn't use simulation. Uh, uh, so it's, if you take simulation-based optimization or simulation optimization, as I call it, it's number one tool. Okay, number two, uh, Dave said it's the cost. Well, it turns out that the cost of a simulation model, building a simulation model and maintaining a model, is less than 1% of most industrial projects that I know of. And I have experience with UPS and lots of you know, industrial projects. And it's typically very small compared to the cost of the project. And in particular, it's an indispensable tool when you try to design something. Uh, so when I was a consultant to UPS for the, uh, port ex the world port expansion in Louisville, uh, there was no port, okay? You had to, you know, expand and simulation model was the tool to use. Okay, and I did not build the model. I was just there a few days and supervised the group that built the model. So that, uh, that was another fun project that I ever had, and that was the beast of all projects. Uh, 220 miles of conveyors, uh, half a million parcels per hour processing capacity. So that was fun. Okay, number three <laughs> is, that's in honor of one of my former professors who died recently, that's Harvey Wagner, uh, one of the fathers of operations research. In 1969, uh, he published a book in Introduction to Operations Research and called simulation the tool of last resort. That was 1969. When I took a class with him in 1985, he said, no, I'm halfway split. And when I met him in the 1990s, he said, no, that's the tool of first resort. So you're talking to someone whose career spanned, you know, 45, 50 years teaching operations research, uh, inventory theory, you know, he's the father of the wagner witten you know, lot sizing problem, uh, the SS inventory policies, and it was a huge transformation to see uh, from one of the pioneers of OR. So with this, um, let's actually display the latest, greatest thing that Dave and I and couple of students did. Uh, and this is the warehousing operations at the Mercedes plant in Vance, Alabama. Uh, <clears throat> our collaborator or the contact was Christopher Sharp, uh, who I think now is leaving, but there will be a successor, so there will be more fun. Uh, this is the facility. So I, I literally took uh, uh, a you know, snip of the facility, and I'm actually highlighting some areas. So the warehouse on the left, the assembly plants on the right. Uh, there is a tunnel that was the source of the initial concern, in particular, the traffic in the tunnel. Uh, there is 
some areas on the left, so I'm going to elaborate on some of these areas that I've enclosed. And the idea will be that we were actually trying uh, to simulate movements of loads, and loads can be different you know, part types batched in one entity, so that's a load or commodity that moves from the upper left corner of the warehouse to the assembly line. Okay? Uh, there are three different types of loads. Uh, I don't need to elaborate on that. Some of those are actually containing parts for a single car. Uh, and then there is another type of load, which is combinations of engines and transmissions. And they all go on dollies, and dollies are moved by automated guided trains. They call them AGTs. Um, okay, so after the train, you know, the train, you know, picks up, picks up a dolly, you know, dollies, moves them, you know, moves through paths, has to go through the tunnel, moves to the assembly line. Over there, there are multiple drop points where it drops the parts or the dollies. Okay, and then it does a loop. It picks up empty dollies, you know, comes back to the warehousing facility goes through a process to unload the dollies, okay, and then moves back again to pick up new dollies and come to the facility. Okay, so uh, the animation is not perfect because there is always a trade-off between building something that you can use now and beautifying it later. Uh, I'm not a fan of beauty until I need beauty. Okay, so you may see trains here that actually pass each other which is physically impossible. But it can be modified if I take the single track where it, you know, trains part and just make six parallel tracks. And it doesn't make a difference on delivery times or delay times or anything else. It's just visual. OK, so the idea will be um, the first objective that we had. Uh, we started in February 2016. Uh, we focused on train operation. And the first objective was to eliminate congestion at pickup and delivery locations, as well as the tunnel. The tunnel was number one. OK, and I can tell you that we have not gone into aisle operations. So we basically drop a load, OK, and then we don't worry what happens to that load. OK, that's maybe phase two or phase three. OK, um, so we actually used, there are many alternatives that we could use. We could use auto mode. We could use, which is perfect for warehousing operations, uh, beautiful 3D. It's an older language. We could use any logic. We could use Simio. And we use Simio because I teach Simio. And then I had students who were actually out of my undergraduate class who were willing to program uh, as part of undergraduate you know, research. Okay? Uh, and it's actually a lot easier to work sometimes with some of those students than you know, master students or PhD students who have many other things in mind. Okay, so I got, you know, free, nice free labor, cheap labor, uh, and the students delivered. Uh, now, what happened was, I will not go exactly on what, you know, the original design was, but what we're actually trying to do is spread the pickup and drop points, okay, and the sequencing so that we can actually minimize delays. So we want to find, you know, optimal locations of these drop points. We want to find how many trains we need, okay, to actually minimize congestion. Uh, so, where is my model? Okay, uh, it will take a while. I have the 3D view. Uh, oops. Oh yes, yes, yes. I need to get out of. Yeah. Why is Microsoft complicating my life? Not yet. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is like a 3D rendering, and you can see trains you know, uh, trains that are full, you know, going from the warehouse to the assembly line and empty trains. Uh, the yellow trains, if I zoom in, uh, you 
yellow trains are the engine trains, and the other trains carry the two, two, actually three different types of loads. Uh, some of those are blue, some of those are orange, and some of those are red, depending on the types of loads that move from the warehouse to the assembly line. The process that I highlighted when the trains return is in this loop. So they return empty, then they get processed, and then... Uh, so the animation is not perfect by any means. Sometimes you will see trains that are uh, gray. Uh, these are empty trains, and typically they don't contain dollies. Okay, but it doesn't matter if I show that picture or an empty train. Okay, so uh, as I said, the animation is not the primary concern. Uh, the primary concern was to actually do something that actually illustrates the new location and design of the pickup and drop points. Okay, so this is the current state of the model. Uh, it's it's really 3D. We have the the warehouse here and. You can rotate, you can shift things up. Uh, as I said, again, animation was not the number one tool. Uh, the number one des uh, desire. Uh, if, if I need something beautiful, I, I can get students to spend a month and beautify it. Uh, now, you may don't, uh, I said I do not agree always that animation is important. Well, sometimes it is very important, okay? And I want to relay one example where Dave and I uh, built this giant supply chain simulation for a company and one of the US forces. And Dave had the honor to present in front of four-star generals in San Diego. I've never seen Dave presenting to four-star generals, but uh, it was optimization of inventory for the Air Force, for parts. And the model did not have anything to do with ARENA or Simeo, it was all uh, with C++ uh, running on a big giant database uh, and an optimization engine. Uh, but to illustrate what happens, we used ARENA uh, because the generals could actually see one part getting replenished with a service level of 99.8%. Okay, and we displayed that, they were very pleased, and then they said, what's the end result? We said, overall service level, 99.9%. They said, case closed, next one. All right, so the animation is a nice tool to actually illustrate uh, why things happen and when. Uh, I have fought in you know, similar battles or many years at, or when I consulted with UPS, uh, animation was big one at the company. Um, Simulation uh, is, as I said, it's the tool of first resort, but also very important. It's very important to understand what simulation does and what doesn't. Okay, it's it's a perennial discussion about what simulation does and what doesn't do. Okay, simulation will not give you the optimal solution. Okay, simulation will give you alternatives. Uh, you can actually use design of experiments and simulation to find the best alternative. But when you display, you must be aware between the differences of the real world simulation and actual implementations. For example, if you simulate UPS, okay, I'll give you a perfect example. It's many conveyors are inclining, right? Uh, inclined conveyors mean friction, right? In auto mode or name the software, everything goes up the conveyor. In reality, it may slide, okay? Uh, or it's what I'm thinking of, many conveyors making a turn at UPS, okay? There will be many electromechanical components that con you know, control these conveyors. It's very easy to simulate that, but it doesn't mimic reality because what the, co the electromechanical devices, the controls are doing, is different from what simulation does, and is different what the human eye thinks. Okay, so there's always a discrepancy that you always have to fight in the real world, All right? So, uh, since we're talking about supply chains, uh, there are simulation models that are humongous now. Uh, in particular, Simeo has, you can see the hierarchy there, you can see model up there. Uh, it turns out you can have multiple models you know, linked to a single project. So you can take a supply chain, for instance, the Mercedes supply chain, 
have the you know, Vans plant in Alabama, you can have the Stuttgart plant, you can have lots of other plants, and then they can all be part of a simulation model that's actually part of a project. Okay, and you can simulate flows of parts from one facility to the other, you can simulate planes, you can simulate deliveries, you can do lots of what ifs. Uh, the last word that I have is Simio is not the best, necessarily the best tool. Others like any logic. I know Leon McGuinness uses any logic. No? Once. Once. Very expensive. Well, it's still less than 1% of the project, right? Uh, but it's hard to communicate to industry. Uh, there are other tools like any logic, Automod, Flexim uh, out there. Uh, Simio was one you know, thing that I wanted to use because we had the, you know, the luxury of the students uh, and the, as I said, you know, cheap labor. Uh, all of these students are done, have done very well. They, they are getting good jobs now. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, I want to tell you what's next at the Alabama facility. Oops. Uh, what's actually happening at this moment is we want to incorporate man-driven trains in the warehouse. So trains that are AGTs, then they're driven by humans to specific areas, and then the humans, you know, hand off the train to automatic, okay, back. Uh, we're actually going to evaluate that. Uh, we want to simulate operations at the aisles. Uh, we want to improve the animation. That's always pleasing the eye of executives, okay? Uh, executives like animations, whether you like it or not. Uh, and then we want to incorporate interactive optimizations. So as I said, simulation by itself is not a tool if you don't try to improve your system with simulation, okay? So the ultimate goal is to use simulation as part of some optimization scheme. So. With this, I want to thank you, and I'm here for questions. We are both here for questions. I have one question from Antilo. I actually was standing there 24 hours ago working with Mercedes. Um, you asked about the what if, what if questions which you can simulate. Does simulation also help to ask the right questions? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I could think, what if the trains go faster? What if they are, I don't know what it is. Sure. Yes. Of course. How would you do that? Like you know which are like wheels to turn, for example, or how, how do you know which S? Yeah, you, you have okay, you have an experiment here. You have all your you know, these are all these are variables. Remember I use the term variables in the model, decision variables. So all these are variables, okay? So at, if I want to have another location, I can just have it on and off switch to that location, right? Uh, is it available or it's not available? So it's, it's a control, okay, and it's a variable. And then I can use Simio with, I don't know if I can do that because I can only run it with my license because it's a Georgia Tech license, but I can use an experiment when I can turn and switch variables on and off. So I can actually do experiments. Okay, so I can say this location is available or this location is not available. The speed of the train is this. You know, try different speeds, you know, try that. And I have a complete design of experiments, or I can do st statistical ranking and selection experiments. Leon? Um, so the question I always have about these things is, to what extent can you separate the plant and the control? And how much flexibility do you have to test different control strategies? Do I dedicate trains to zones in the factory? Or you, know, you can think of lots of different control strategies that you might have, both in terms of the inventory itself and in terms of the material handling system. How much flexibility do you have in the simulation to do that? A lot of flexibility if you invest time. Uh -huh. okay. gotcha. I don't think you expected anything different. <laughs> 
Is this your own observation too? It's very Typically, very it's it's very. Contemporary simulation languages. Um, contemporary simulation languages have evolved in a community that's been perfectly happy to mash together control and plan, and that is totally different from every other engineering discipline, where one of the fundamental things you learn is to separate the plan from control. Well. Let me actually correct some of what I said, uh, and that relates to my experience at UPS, and I don't know how much I can talk about it because it's confidential. Uh, uh, but the, the simulation model, that's all I can say, uh, at the Worldport was designed by two Georgia Tech graduates. Uh, one actually graduated with a 2.7 GPA, 2.3, uh, back in time, and his master's degree was a 2.8. He barely made it out. Uh, but here's what they did uh, in response to what you said. UPS was planning, you know, coming up with all these different designs, you know, connecting conveyors. So different, you know, paths to different conveyors, to different connections and different routes and rerouting. So what he actually did was he took the geometry, he parameterized everything, and then ran a Python script that took the parameters of the model and made it automod language, okay, automod code. And he was paid very well for that. And, you know, if that guy dies, uh, they're in trouble. Okay. The same thing happens with every company where the simulation is essential either to strategic decision making or to operational control. Um, Intel, for example, still uses Automod. Yeah. It's, it's an antique language, right? So they're still using it, but they customize code for every important operational decision. So yeah. it's, you know, it's a little bit of this out-of-the-box stuff and then a whole lot of this custom-built stuff. Yes, because I, I bet you you can do that with any logic. I mean, you could, sure. you could actually take you know, the design and then run a Python script that converts it to any logic language. Okay, as long as this, the simulation package has a language that you can actually write, it's doable. I have a problem with some of these packages that actually don't have extensive capabilities or they're actually difficult to get into. Because when you ask, how can I get into that? Uh, you get, oh, you can always do it. Yes, I can always do it, but how extensive is this exercise? And how much access do I get to it? And Automod is one of these tools that are out there that's uh, SimScript 2.5, by the way, which is designed by Harry Markovich, is probably the number one language at the uh, US Department of Defense. It's because it's all code. It's all this is a B-52, but it's still a language that has code. I just wanted to jump in on the control versus plan. But, uh, I, in, in simulation languages and platforms like uh, AnyLogic, for example, uh, you can think of your simulation, if you start from the ground up knowing you're going to do this, you make sure that all the decision making is pulled into agents. So the objects that are just reactive you go by themselves, but every time you've got control the like decisions, you put them into agents, and then it becomes much, much easier to change their behavior. You can change, take the take the agent, uh, just change, add a toggle switch, and use a, a, that other, this, uh, other decision, or you can even change the team of agents that are responsible for decisions, and those agents can have been coded like by other people, whatever, as long as you know what's the input. So if you're disciplined in doing it, uh, then, then now it's much easier than it was in, in, the, in the past. So in our large-scale simulations, we do that extensively. Otherwise, we would be dead and not be able to control anything. I agree. Uh, for the students here, uh, could you explain uh, the control of this plant uh, uh, idea or when you guys mentioned that, what exactly do you mean? I'm not sure I understood. No, you guys, well, for example, students 
students that are here, mm -hmm. or let's say, for example, if you're from a different discipline, let's say ME, mm -hmm. you guys are referencing the control this plant paradigm or example, per se. I just want to be clear about what you mean exactly when you say the control this plant. And when he was talking about how. Yeah, Leon, when you were. Like, you know, uh, no. So, so, so laborers. So the guys who designed the, the, the AGB, the AGT, mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you have a bunch of mechanical engineers and electrical engineers designing that system, I guarantee you they're going to separate the, the specification of the yes. hardware from the specification of the software. Yes. So plan and control are clearly distinct. Mm -hmm. When you go to most, at least most simple simulation models, plan and control all get smashed together. So a Q, for example, represents something on the factory floor, but the Q control is part of that representation of the thing on the factory floor, as opposed to having an explicit model of a manufacturing execution system or a warehouse execution system, which would be control, and then you'd have a model of a plant, which is all the physical stuff that's, that's actually doing that. So does that answer your? Yeah. I mean, it, it's <clears throat> my experience as an IE, you know, working with electrical engineers and mechanical engineers, they call them architects, is very interesting because they speak different languages. Okay? Uh, I remember, you know, talking to guys at, you know, UPS who do electromechanical controls. They were not speaking the same language I do. Okay? But the beauty of that was of that experience where some of those guys were electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, but they had done an IE at uh, what's now Kennesaw State. Uh, so finally, you know, they, we spoke the same language, but if you took an electrical engineer, and I know very well my son is an electrical engineer, we don't speak the same language. You know, what he means a simulation is very different from what I mean, okay? Uh, so uh, it's, the fields have not merged yet very well both on the planning and execution. So it's, it's a different world out there. So kind of along the same lines, uh, if you want to build a simulation, maybe solve a bottleneck in a warehouse. If uh, the simulation is looking to mesh the warehouse management and the warehouse control system mm -hmm. kind of in one flow, do you, do you just have to do different iterations for every different variable, um, like a different experiment for every variable that you could change? Because you could change everything from order release to capacity of conveyance to labor? No, if you, if you use, you know, these packages like Simio, you know, for example, you can build an experiment. If you define uh, something as a control variable, as a variable, okay, uh, then it becomes control variable of an experiment. So when I run the experiment, I have a mesh of control variables that I can change, okay? And the easiest way I can do uh, right now is as long as I don't have a million of those, because you have to be careful of you know, how many you have. Uh, what I usually do, and that's what I teach in classes, is I do a simulation optimization experiment where I vary multiple of those, several of those in a reasonable range. And the experiment tells me these top 20 are seemingly the best. Okay, and then I will take the top 10 or 20 and then I will do a serious statistical analysis to find my best. Okay, so all these tools actually have uh, optimization experiments. It's not what we call, you know, typical optimization. They are heuristic optimization experiments using taboo search and genetic algorithms and <clears throat> name it. Uh, and they are all hidden in packages like OpQuest uh, by Fred Glover, but you don't know what they do. They, at the end, they tell you, you know, the, the top 10 or 20 alternatives, and what I usually do is I take those alternatives and I present to management, and then we get in discussions. Uh, because then it, it actually lets them focus off on what's important. What these paradigms will do is screen out real losing designs, okay, real poor designs. So we'll say, okay, this is worthless. Sometimes it makes intuitively, it, intuitive, intuitive sense, sometimes it doesn't, uh, and then you have to think. Okay, but what I usually do is I screen out some potential designs and then I'm focusing on those designs. Now, some of those, 
I tell you, at UPS, they did not have the luxury of doing many of those because one run took one day okay, of that system. That was back in 2007, I guess. Uh, so today it could be one run eight hours, you know, who knows. Uh, but there are not too many things that you need to tweak. And, and the process is actually long. Uh, it, it probably took about three years. I held them for about six months and I walked out. It was too much. Okay, but I mean, I, I gave them, you know, the specifics, some guidelines, and then I was off because my job is to teach simulation here, not work at the company. Going further with your question, we were basically talking about uh, many combinations you can add. We have to say unloading the train from 10 seconds to 10 minutes. Same for loading the train, same for the speeds, yeah, like 5 meters per second, 5 per minute, and so forth, like, uh, different ranges. How do you basically determine like, the pre screening? You say you pick up the good ones and then you start with optimization because that's actually good about what we're doing. I said I want to have this human factor as would be somebody who says these are good points, I want to investigate further. Like what project I'm doing, I want to have this human factor out of the equation. Because how do I know, let's say in my case, the planner makes a good decision. Maybe it's a totally bad decision, it's just experience, which might be, well, maybe good, but not very good, or not optimal. How do you determine what you think is in the right direction? Okay, yeah. Uh, from my experience, the best way to do this is to involve several levels of management. Uh, not necessarily the top level, but the guys who are actually on the floor sometimes fighting. Uh, my, and I actually teach a whole class of about 50 minutes to students of how to work with companies. Uh, it's never ignore the low level you know, technician or, you know, the, because you're such a smart professor, you know, you're going there and you think you know everything, uh, you probably have ignored, you know, the low-level technician. I'll give you an example. There was one lady at UPS who was a low-level technician, and she started talking statistics at one meeting, and I'm saying, what do you know about statistics? She has, I have a master's in statistics from Moscow State University. Uh, her husband, you know, was in the U.S. She was a you know, she had come to the U.S., she was looking for a job, she found that job, and she was running the floor, right? She got a Master of Statistics. I mean, just, you, you never know who you're talking to, okay? So my advice is always talk from the higher level to the lower level, always involve the lower level, okay? Just have them on the table and listen to them. They have knowledge that you probably never have. Uh, I'll give you one more example. Uh, Dave and I did a job at, uh, it was a student project at Chick-fil-A. And we talked to the manager at Chick-fil-A on uh, Howell Mill. And the, the guy comes and says, here are my you know, inter-arrival times. These are my you know, service times. I have data. I have different service times depending on the order. And then these are my arrival rates. My rates fluctuate through the day. And I say, what the heck do you know about this? He says, I'm an IE from... Kennesaw State University. Now, it used to be Southern Tech. But you just never know who you talk to. So my advice is involve low, you know, all levels of, uh, of, tech, of uh, personnel. And sometimes you get lucky because the person you talk to is extremely knowledgeable. Like one of the best things, you know, gigs that Dave and I did was with a supply chain company, transportation company, where the lady that ran the OR department was a former uh, graduate student at Georgia Tech. And she was perfect. I mean, we, we spoke the same language as, as soon as I said, I need this you know, number one, number two, number three, number four. She came on and said, yeah, I know what you guys are talking about. And then I said, how good animation do you need? She says, as long as I can get by. Wasn't she at Schneider? Yeah. Schneider before and then Allied Axis. Uh, she was like a dream come true, right? Uh, but very few of us have been so lucky to interact with knowledgeable people from industry. Sometimes you get someone who just doesn't know even the problem. And it's your job to convince. So, a couple of questions. 
Yes. I've been in manufacturing a long time. When I was a kid, we thought the best thing to do was build a huge lot size at a work center, send it in the warehouse, pull it out, work it through another work center, put it back in the warehouse, et cetera, et cetera, right? And the EOQ said that's the brilliant thing to do. Right? Yeah. Years later came just in time, and then suddenly it wasn't a brilliant thing to do. Uh, and you see that over and over again, right? Uh, the best thing we know says, wow, we ought to be doing this, and then somebody broadens their mind, and suddenly that's not the most intelligent thing to do, right? So the first question is, how do we, what causes that? Is it just a lack of imagination? And the second question is, is it, is it better to not design systems that learn and adapt based on the reality on the ground, or is it better to try and figure it out up front? Because I've seen lots of warehouses with miles of conveyors sitting there idle and running nothing, right? I'm sure the engineers thought it was a brilliant thing to do to have all those conveyors, but there's nothing on it, right? So what are your thoughts? Well, it depends. <clears throat> And again, I think this leaves simulation now. This, this becomes more of like an IEOR you know, strategy. Uh, it depends on you know, what your company, what your objectives are. Uh, if you are, for example, the airport here, or I, I don't want to use UPS all the time, you know, the airport, how do you design your conveyor systems? Uh, typically, you design them so that they are very functional on specific days of the year because you have that constraint. You know, December 20 to 24, uh, around Thanksgiving and, and what happens is many of the other days they are idle. You know, many of these conveyors are actually idle. Uh, they don't have enough traffic. Um, I don't know how to do it, honestly. Depends on, you know, if, if you are, for example, UPS, I mean, you, you, close to Christmas, you have promised deliveries, right, by Christmas Day. I mean, your livelihood depends on that, your existence. So you probably design it, you know, as those specifications. Um, there it, yes, yes, that's what I that's what I meant. You design by modularity. So, um, and and the, the control is another issue, which I can actually get, but it's proprietary how it's done. Uh, you design it with modularity. You use certain components based on, you escalate the use of components based on traffic. A big thing of these systems is recirculation, uh, which is, you know, it's done at airports and UPS and all these companies. When you have a lot of traffic, you recirculate until, until the, actually the item, you know, gets back to the proper conveyor and the spare line. Um, and it, it's a lot of knowledge by a few people who actually run those systems. So I bet you at the airport there is some expert out there who says, if you look at my traffic today, I'm going to activate, you know, this sub-model and this sub-model of conveyors, and this is going to work for today. And if my traffic increases tomorrow, I'm going to activate a few more. So we cannot take the human out of the equation at those systems. I know we try to program everything, but there is a human mind there that's better than many programming and learning methodologies. Did I answer both questions or one? Maybe. I'm sure you got the second one. The first one, I'm not totally yet. I mean, how do we imagine more so that uh, the simulation gives us the maximum? Uh, it, at that, that is a more theoretical issue, which is you know, basic research. Uh, how we went from the EOQ problem, you know, the model to just in time and uh, you know, push-pull systems and smart scheduling. This is basic research, okay? And this is done in academic offices and classrooms. Uh, but again, the scalability of some of those is another thing, how you, you take something and scale it. I know Martin is, <laughs> he has been at those front lines. <laughs> You can probably validate your current, so you model your, your current uh, setup, but let's say if you would That's still an open problem. <laughs> uh, validation is the biggest monster out there, okay? Uh, because it relies, there are actually books on verification validation. 
it relies on human input, uh, hardcore statistics. You're running, you know, the real system, you compare with the simulation and see if, you know, the means match, you know, quantiles match, you know, performance measures. But you also need the human factor. Now, I, I can tell you this, there is no simulation model that I have seen that's 95% valid. Okay, and I take the Fifth Amendment. If somebody has a model that's 100% valid, raise your hand. Uh, there is nothing that's totally valid. It's what makes management and users comfortable using. Okay, and I remember my experiment, uh, experience with Dave and uh, what's the name, Rene Gulven, yeah, uh, who was at Schneider. I mean, he was perfect. He said, hey guys, I don't want 100% validity. I need 90% comfort. She never used the term validity. And he says, am I comfortable? You know, is my 90% feeling right? Am I? And as soon as he said, yes, I am, that was a model. Because models are very complex. You cannot, you, you cannot take the, you know, simulate the human factor in some of these, you know, plants. I mean, in, in the Mercedes plant, can I simulate the human? The only thing I can do about the human is say the peak time is 10, you know, 20 plus or minus three seconds, right? That's all I can say. But some humans, once I say, oh, this guy is slower than the other one and start getting into that, what's the, I can tell you from my experiment, experience is the expect on throughput is minimal, okay? And if you're looking at collective measures, not focusing at a very tiny single operation, you're looking at, you know, performance, how many parts can I move? Okay, throughputs and things like that, the effect of that's minimal. Okay, so this, now, if I go to a fictitious model for something that doesn't exist, all bets are off, right? I'm designing a model and I'm hoping that it's going to mimic reality because the system doesn't exist. And I don't have any other option to do it. If I'm the airport, you know, how many millions of dollars do I need to spend on conveyors until I figure out the right configuration? I just do a design and I'm praying that what my design will do will be, you know, some science and some prayer that my design will actually give the best performance. And then I'm tweaking that system. But the idea will be to make it modular. Okay, the more modular I make it, the better it is because I have flexibility of shutting down components and bring components up. Depends on how big the model becomes. Uh, if it's idle operations and I'm not, I don't really care about where exactly I will put something on an aisle because that's not that important at the moment. If I can say, you know, travel time is based on different locations, I can split the aisle in multiple locations, nodes. And I can say you go from node A to node B in so many minutes, then it takes another you know, random time to place the component, I can do that. But if you want like a visual where I actually worry about the, the placement of the component, then I may break it. But it still doesn't make my model smaller because my project contains multiple models and my overall model is not smaller, it's just a visual. I take the Fifth Amendment because I, I, I learned, you know, working with these models that you can never promise anything until you actually do it. I think we've about run out of time. Uh, please join me in thanking Professor Stoltzman and Alexa Poulos.